Hi, and welcome to this special live online workshop. I'm Jerry Jenkins, and today we're looking at the key elements of self-editing that can make a huge difference to the quality of your writing. I want to welcome everyone. We have hundreds of people joining, and I'm going to um, stall here a little bit to allow as many into the room as possible. This is really a huge, uh, huge group, so we're glad you're all here. People are, are coming into the room from all over the world. Um, I'm in Colorado. Our engineer is in Alabama. Our guest, Chris, where are you? I'm in uh, Palma in Spain. In Spain. So we have all kinds of technical things we need to, to be very careful of to make it all work. A quick clarification, the kind of self-editing we're talking about today is not what editors refer to as substantive or big picture editing, where you examine things like structure and flow and pacing and character development. Rather, we're talking today about what would be considered copy editing or line editing. We're concentrating on word choice and sentence construction, basically the writing itself. Now, my guest today from uh, across the pond is Chris Banks, creator of Pro Writing Aid. That's an editing software program for writers. Chris developed Pro Writing Aid to improve his own self-editing process, and today, more than 700,000 writers use it. Thanks for taking the time to be with me today, Chris. Thanks, Jerry. I can't wait to get started. Great. Now, I want to urge everyone to stay with us for the whole time today because we're going to open the floor for Q&A at the end of the training, so you won't want to miss that. In fact, as soon as a question arises in your mind, enter it in the chat box on the right side of your screen, and then when we're through with the training, we'll see how many of these we can get to. Now, if you're a member of my Writers Guild or my Your Novel Blueprint program, you know I teach what I call ferocious self-editing because it's crucial you put your best foot forward and are happy with every word before you submit it to an agent or a publisher. To me, the hardest writing work I do is creating a story from nothing. Writing that first draft, getting the story down, is just tough work. But to me, the editing and revising is a joy. It plays to my perfectionist tendencies. And I love carving that hunk of meat and seeing it come together just the way I want it to. But you may be the opposite. You may love the writing phase, but dread the editing stage. Uh, how about you, Chris? Where do you come down on these two fairly disparate tasks? I think I actually like both. Um, we hear from writers all the time that finish their first draft and they don't know where to go next. Um, they find the whole process of editing daunting, but I love it. For me, I, I think to take your analogy of carving a hunk of meat a bit further, um, I find writing is like going out and gathering all of the ingredients. Uh, and then the editing phase is like taking all of those ingredients and, and cooking them up into an amazing dish. Um, mm. So they're quite different skills, but uh, they're both equally enjoyable. And uh, I find that the, the editing gives my creative mind a refreshing break so that later I can go back and look at the manuscript with fresh eyes. Yeah, that's me too. In fact, my favorite quote about editing comes from writer Francine Prose in her book, Reading Like a Writer. Listen to this. She says, for any writer, the ability to look at a sentence and see what's superfluous, what can be altered, revised, expanded, and especially cut is essential. It's satisfying to see that sentence shrink, snap into place, and ultimately emerge in a more polished form, clear, economical, sharp. I, I love her name for one thing, Francine Prose, the perfect name for, for a writer. But basically what she's saying is write your piece, edit and revise it, then send it but only once you're happy with every word. Don't make the mistake of assuming editing is the publisher's job. On the one hand, it is, and they will edit, but they have to like your manuscript first. An agent or an acquisitions editor can tell within a couple of pages of a poorly edited manuscript whether it's worth continuing. That may not sound fair, but it's true, and it's not their job to tell you why they're passing on your writing. Their job is to find publishable stuff and if it's not yours, they move on. Our job is to polish and tweak and tighten our writing to give them every chance to love it. Now, if you've sat under my teaching before, you may have already been using my self-editing checklist for a while. 
Many are surprised to find that the tips I give there are not about grammar. Now, that's not because grammar isn't important. It is. But my checklist focuses on style and clarity. Exactly. I mean, in your training, you uh, help your students understand the weaknesses of things like passive voice, the importance of showing versus telling, and detecting subtle redundancies and much more. Now, ProWriting Aid won't fix those problems for you, but what it will do is it will find them in your manuscript, it'll explain why they're problematic, and then you can decide on the appropriate fixes. I read a lot of writing from inexperienced writers, and my goal is to help them polish their prose to where they can confidently compete in the marketplace. With Pro Writing Aid, you offer a tool that goes far beyond spelling and grammar to highlight these style issues like consistency, repetitiveness, and other problems writers will want to fix at the revision stage. Yeah, that's right. So today, let's look at some of those style issues, delve into why they're problematic, and then I'll ask you, Chris, to explain how pro writing aid helps writers fix them. Sounds great. All right. Now, just to make sure we're on the right track here, if you'd find it useful for Chris to give us a quick demo, just type yes into the chat box at the bottom right of your screen. Go ahead and do that right now. Oh, good. I see, I see many yeses rolling in here already, Chris. So uh, could you go ahead and do that for us? Sure. Let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, so uh, hopefully you can all see my screen now. This is the Pro Writing Aid Editor. Uh, so you can see, actually, you can have real-time checking that that uh, uh, will give you tips. Um, this is just a, a grammar error. Um, one of the most useful things to do straight away is put your writing into here um, and then run a summary report. Um, now, this summary report will analyze your writing for a whole bunch of uh, different aspects. Um, so it will give you an overall score, um, and that's broken down by grammar, spelling, and style. Um, and it will give you some key actions that you can do to improve that writing. Um, it'll also go through and give you statistics on the document, including word count, sentences, um, the vocabulary you've used. Um, it'll go through and talk about readability measures, which we'll cover soon. Um, and you can see even it broken down by paragraph. Um, it'll look at things like overused words, uh, sentence structure, sentence length writing style, and, and even grammar and spelling. So you can see uh, there's a whole lot of uh, aspects in here. And in fact, there's over 20 different ways that you can look at your writing. Um, so it's a tool that you can either use for doing very quick revisions, or you can go into great depth and, and look at how to improve your, your writing. Um, so it's, it's useful for, for all different kinds of things. Thanks, Chris. That that should give you an idea how Pro Writing Aid works. Now, again, remember to stay with us for the whole time today so you can get in on our Q&A session at the end. Enter your question into the chat box, and we'll see how many of these we can get to. Now, let's talk about the problem of passive voice. The way to spot passive voice is to look for state of being verbs. Uh, you can Google the list of state of being verbs and keep it handy or even memorize it. Uh, I can remember in junior high school being taught the state of being verbs and and they just roll off the tongue now. I, I think, okay, what are they? Is, am, are, was, were, be, being, been, has, have, had, do, uh, does, did, shall, will, should, would, may, might, must, can't, could. Now, some people put those to music. Um, also, passive construction often includes uh, the word by. Let me give you two quick examples. Uh, it'd be passive to say the party was planned by Jill. If you want to write that in active voice, you say Jill planned the party. Passive would be the wedding cake was created by Ben. Active voice would be Ben created the wedding cake. You see how much more direct and powerful the, the active sentences are. And it's easy to slip into passive voice. We often talk this way. Um, and we can find ourselves writing that way too. Really something to watch for. Now, there's a way to um, uh, avoid this. If you're having trouble getting your mind around this, here's something you should be able to remember. 
if you can add the phrase by zombies after the verb, you're in passive voice. Let me repeat that. If you can add the phrase by zombies after the verb, you're in passive voice. Consider these two examples again. The party was planned. If you can say by zombies, you're in passive. Active is Jill planned the party. Passive, the wedding cake was created by zombies. If you can say that, you're in passive voice. Active, Ben created, or zombies created the wedding cake. So avoid passive construction. Your writing will read with much more power. Plus, you'll increase your chances of getting more than five minutes of an agent's or an acquisition editor's time. Yeah, exactly. And you could go through your whole document finding passive voice yourself. Um, but one thing that pre-writing aid does is it does it for you. Um, we make the process more efficient and, and save you time. Um, so what our tool does is it scans the document and highlights um, every sentence which is written in the passive. Um, and then you can read it and see if it's in the passive voice, uh, see if it makes sense. Sometimes the passive voice does, but normally not. Um, then you take a moment to revise it and then you move on to the next instance. Eventually, as you go through the document, your momentum will build, um, your brain will be on full passive voice alert, and you can smash through chapter after chapter fixing passive voice where necessary. Okay, that's helpful. Now, when you want to examine your manuscript, um, you want to examine your manuscript to be sure you're just saying it. I often write that in the margin of, uh, of uh, pieces I see. What do I mean here? Just that unless you're writing heavily academic material or deep literary fiction, you want to write as simply and straightforwardly as possible. Too often, beginning writers fall into the use of a language that I call written ease, just like we have Chinese and Japanese and Portuguese. Here's written ease. They feel their creativity, word choice, turn of phrase, turn of phrase needs to show. The problem is that drawing attention to your writing is intrusive and can get in the way of your content, your message, what it is you want to convey. The point is not your writing technique, it's your message. So avoid the temptation to show off your writing and think reader first, keeping your content king. Don't intrude. Stay out of the way of your message. Chris, show us how Pro Writing Aid can help with this. Sure. So. Our tool can do a couple of things. So the first thing that uh, pre-writing aid gives you is readability scores. Uh, so we use the flesh reading ease, which is one of the most well-known readability indices. Um, even the US military uses it to assess the readability of their technical manuals. So it calculates the number of words in each sentence, then the average number of syllables in each word, and gives you two scores, one of which is a, a readability assessment of between one and 120. The higher the number, the, the more readable your document is and then a grade level that shows your readability compared to American school years. So we suggest targeting between 60 and 70 for fiction. Um, this would mean you're writing to readers with at least a seventh grade level of comprehension. So that may sound uh, not seem like a high enough level, um, but you'd be surprised at how often this level is uh, used by magazines like Reader, Reader's Digest and, and others. Um, Ernest Hemingway's fiction score at grade school level um, so don't mistake that for juvenile writing. It simply indicates how much work it would be for the average adult to easily understand your prose. Anything above seventh or eighth grade might mean your readers has to work too hard to understand it. That's right. My goal is to allow my readers to easily navigate my writing so they can enjoy it and get the point without undue effort. I want them to easily lose themselves in the story. Right, so the editing call gives you an overall score for your, uh, score for your manuscript, um, but then what you can also do is you go through and see the score uh, for each paragraph, so it'll help you find paragraphs that are particularly hard to read. Um, the other report that, that's great for this uh, and helping with it is the writing style. So our writing style report is a comprehensive check of, of uh, several elements, um, but one of the most important um, is uh, readability enhancements. So readability enhancements are the kind of typical changes that a copy editor would make. Um, so, you know, when they're going through your, your writing, uh, they will do things like look at nominalizations, which is where you've used a noun instead of a, a verb. So make a decision. 
is a nominalization, you should use decide instead. Um, and there's literally thousands of these changes that we make. Um, and the great thing is that by doing it automatically and by doing it yourself using our tool, you go through um, and then your copy editor doesn't have to do that. Um, what they can do is they can focus on the more important things, you know, like characterization and flow of your writing. Um, so you get more from your copy editor by covering these uh, more simple changes yourselves. And it also prompts you to remove complex words uh, when a simpler one would do. So your writing is easier to read. Yeah, that's great. I, I urge writers to replace words that your readers would have to look up. All right. Next, let's look at identifying and cutting redundancies. These are a pet peeve of mine. How often have you seen writers mention past history? I think that's the best kind, don't you? <laughs> or future plans. What other kinds of plans would there be? Uh, some write that their character has stepped out onto frozen ice as opposed to what? Melted ice? How about this trifecta? She nodded her head in agreement. What else would a person nod but her head? And do we need to be told that when she nods, it's in agreement? Here's another. These are subtle redundancies. He clapped his hands. What else would he clap? She shrugged her shoulders. What else would she shrug? He blinked his eyes. Same question. I see this a lot. People talk about he squinted his eyes as if he could maybe squint his ears. They heard the sound of a train whistle. You can delete the sound of. If they heard a train whistle, they heard a train whistle. We know it's a sound. Uh, even though I refer to these as simple, uh, subtle redundancies, I see them a lot. Yeah, they drive me uh, crazy too. I think they, they just add quantity and not quality to your writing. Um, so we have a redundancies check that looks for about 300 different types of redundancy in your writing and highlights them for you. Things very similar to the, the suggestions that you've given above. Um, so uh, we're adding more all the time as well. So if anyone else has any, then feel free to uh, send them our way. Um, and this same report also catches cliches. Yeah, cliches are unoriginal by definition. We write them when we don't have the energy or the inspiration to create something new. Now, you may have a character who speaks in cliches. That's one thing. But otherwise, avoid such obvious cliches as diamond in the rough, easy as pie, don't judge a book by its cover, light as a feather, that type of thing. Yeah, writers often resort to cliches when they're writing their first drafts because they're just trying to get the story down. And that's fine because not using a cliche would interrupt your flow. Um, but when you go back to edit, um, you need to be more creative and you need to come up with fresh wording for these cliches. A new analogy or metaphor will make your writing much uh, better for your readers to read. And so we look for about 500 different cliches in, our, in your writing automatically and highlight them for you. And then you can just go through and try and come up with a, a better metaphor. Excellent. Now, another of my pet peeves is the misuse of dialogue tags or what is known as attribution. Dialogue tags let the reader know who's talking. The most common are said and asked. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I never use asked because the question mark at the end of the line of dialogue makes it redundant. That's sort of a new trend and it, it's coming. So watch for it. it. It isn't absolutely necessary. And there are editors who don't get it yet either. And they'll say, you don't want to say, have a question mark and then say he said. And I say, actually, I do because we already know it's a question. Now, dialogue tags are necessary, but they fail when they draw attention to themselves. They're supposed to be just signposts clarifying something for readers. When you get creative with them, and rather than writing simply that someone said something, you have them wheeze or gasp or sigh or laugh or grunt or snort, reply, retort, exclaim, or declare something. Some of those are archaic. Others are impossible. Try, try gasping words. You can't do it. Uh, I see other times where people will say, uh, give an action instead of, of the fact that somebody said something. They'll make a quote, comma, close quote, Jane looked away or whatever. And you can't look words away either. Uh, 
Now, it's okay to have someone yell or holler or whisper, but beyond that, overly creative dialogue tags intrude on the reading experience and slow the action. Yeah, more than anything, tag like, tags like those uh, distract the reader. I mean, I always say that your characters, their, their tone of voice should be so distinct that you shouldn't actually need to have dialogue tags. So you might have them, uh, you know, for the first two lines of dialogue, but beyond that, it should be obvious to the reader who is speaking and which of your characters. Um, so author Jay Moore says, uh, if dialogue is so weak that the writers have to, have to explain what emotions or motivations are being conveyed, uh, there may uh, be more serious per problems lurking. So we have a, in Pro Writing Aid a dialogue tag check, which uh, helps you find all of the attributions in your text so you, you can go through and you can look at um, if you're overusing them or if you're using these Im impossible words, as, as Jerry says. Great, now next up is one of the most well-known bits of writing advice anywhere. Show, don't tell. This is the tip we hear most often, but many beginning writers have a hard time grasping it. It's really as simple as this. Don't tell me it's cold outside. Show your character turning up his collar, tightening his scarf, shoving his hands deep into his pockets, and turning his face away from a biting wind. Don't tell me he was angry. Show him kicking something or throwing something or shouting at someone. Don't tell me she was nervous. Show me. Yeah, and pro writing again, we we try and help you find instances of telling. Um, and what we do is we look for words like new, felt, and sore, um, but also for emotion. So if you said he was happy, we'll flag that as a potential uh, uh, telling rather than showing. So think about the the sentence Bill knew Jason was lying. In this example, you don't want to tell the reader that. You want to show them. Uh, it by describing how Jason knew uh, that he was lying. Uh, what was Jason doing that gave him away to Bill? Uh, show Jason stammering and avoiding eye contact. Show Bill watching him carefully. Um, Pro Writing Aid's overused report highlights where you might be telling rather than showing, uh, and so you can find better ways to phrase the scene. Okay, let's talk about the misuse and the overuse of adverbs. Adverbs are merely crutches for weak verbs. And beware especially of hedging adverbs like smiled slightly, almost laughed, frowned a bit. People either do these things or they don't. Good writing is a thing of strong nouns and verbs, not adverbs and adjectives. So use them sparingly. Agreed. Again, like many of the rules we've discussed, there are times when adverbs are exactly right, but more often than not, they're just the sign of weak writing. Um, use pro writing aid to find them, and if appropriate, you can replace them with a stronger verb. Okay, we're running a little low on time. I'd like to get through our training so we have a full half hour for Q&A. So let's take a look at one more writing issue before we open the floor for questions. Besides cliches, redundancies, and subtle redundancies, Many other words are needless and should be cut. Cutting almost always adds power. And one of the most direct bits of advice from the classic The Elements of Style is this, omit needless words. Now there's a rule that follows its own advice. The writers could have spent pages on this, but they simply say, omit needless words. So what are needless words? The word that can almost always be cut without changing the meaning of the sentence. Now, there are times when I'm doing my revision, I'll add the word that back in because it makes the sentence clearer, but usually you don't need it. The word very almost always weakens whatever it intends to modify. Take it out and you'll see that the word uh, has even more power. Uh, more examples of needless words. Here's a line that originally read, located in the back part of the book. We don't need the word located. We don't need the word part. So instead of located in the back part of the book, it's in the back of the book. Here's another line. So sometimes when the sermon seemed long, you just drop the word sometimes. So when the sermon seemed long, here's what this kid did to keep himself busy. So watch for needless words. Yeah, exactly. So our overused report, words report uh, will highlight 
many of the words like that and very, so you can delete them or replace them. Um, another one of my favorite features of pre-writing aid is the sticky sentences report. So what this does is it looks for sentences where you ha have a high level of glue words. And glue words are the 200 or so most common words that don't carry much meaning in themselves, but help you construct your sentences. Words like is, on, the, um, and others. So sentences that contain a high proportion of glue words are often difficult to follow. Uh, so for example, the sentence, Dave walked over into the backyard of the school in order to see if there was a new bicycle that he could use in his class, would be highlighted by pre-writing aid because 60% of the words are glue words. So you can rewrite this as, Dave checked the schoolyard for a new bicycle to use in class. It's more concise and the glue index is only 36%. You've said exactly the same thing with fewer than half of the words. And cutting edge power, as I've said. All right, we'll be open for questions in, in a moment. But Chris, tell us about some of the things we haven't had time to cover in detail. Sure, I'll cover uh, just two more reports that are particularly useful for uh, fiction writers. So the first is the repeat report. Uh, and what this does is it goes through your manuscript and picks out those words and phrases you, uh, you, you've used more than once. So these are the, the phrases that can create an echo in your reader's mind. And they're incredibly hard for you as the writer to find. Um, and uh, they gravitate to ter certain turns of phrase. So you're, you know, every writer has their particular phrases that they, they like to use multiple times without realizing it. Um, but what your readers will do is they will notice it and it will uh, detract from your writing. Um, so we now, highlight those and in fact we also offer suggested changes. Um, so another useful feature of pre-writing aid is the sentence length report. Um, so we say that your writing should have a certain music to it. It should ebb and flow uh, with short sentences and long sentences. If you have too many short sentences then your writing tends to feel choppy, too many long ones and it feels verbose. Uh, what this report does is it gives you a bar chart that shows you the sentence length so you can see where you're using uh, particular clusters of the same length sentences and you can try and add variety into those areas. Um, we also have a cool feature that's called the Word Explorer, which is one of my favorite features, which is allows you to explore uh, words and things like reverse dictionaries, rhymes and that like, lots of things like that. Um, it's great fun and I use it a lot for kind of coming up with new ideas. Um, but I'll leave you to experiment it, uh, with it yourself. Okay, thanks, Chris. Let's take some questions now, and um, we'll go right up to the to the top of the hour. Um, as we begin our Q&A, uh, my team is going to put a link into the chat box with a special offer from Chris, so watch for that. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a peek at, uh, at our first question here. Um... All right, I'm kind of new at this myself, grabbing these questions, but I'm going to find them. Um, let's go with, uh, now I can't find the one I want to start with. All right. Um, all right, let's, let's go with um, that one. Matt, if you can bring it up on the screen for me. Well, I can see one here that says uh, subscription or license. Um, so pro writing aid we offer, you can either pay for a, a yearly license or we also offer a lifetime uh, license. So you have either option. I mean, we realize that some people like to own software outright um, and with your lifetime license, you get free upgrades uh, for, for your lifetime. So. Great. All right. Okay. We've got a question up from Brian. Thanks for asking this question, Brian, for being with us. It says, as a beginning writer, I can see the scenes in my head play out like I'm watching a movie on a screen. But when I try to put these scenes into words, everything just feels flat and wrong. Is this normal? Uh, I can tell you that it is normal, Brian. That's why, um, you know, the reason they call us authors is because we have to figure out how to make this work. And it's just hard work. Um, you know, we, we all were raised on television and movies. We see things that way. And, and of course, our imaginations are even better than Hollywood um, and the TV uh, producers. Um, what you want to do is you want to trigger the theater of your reader's mind. Um, and usually what we're doing when we're trying to make it um, look like the movie we see in our head 
is we use too many words and that slows everything down. You just want to suggest. Um, it, it, this could be a whole um, training session in itself, but um, you know, if if you, I see a lot of um, writers also describe characters, and they describe everything about them: the color of their eyes, the shape of their nose, the protruding cheekbones, the fullness of their lips, that type of thing. Just give them enough that they can imagine the person themselves. Even if you've got thousands of readers and they all see your character a little differently, that's okay. They should look like the, what they want to see in their own head. Um, now, are there things in pro writing aid that would help in this uh, area, Chris, or are we getting a little too esoteric here? I think it would, it will definitely help you see why your writing is a little flat. Um, so obviously it's highlighting things that are boring to the reader or, uh, you know, not really kind of gelling with them. Um, I think the the thing that you're saying about describing every aspect of of uh, the character, we actually have a report that's called the pacing report, and what that looks for is areas where you've given like too much backstory. Um, so it, everything is in the kind of past tense, um, and it will slow the reader down. So you're you're giving the whole backstory of the the character, but as you say, you should introduce all of these bits as you go along. So you need the right balance of, of action and information. Great. All right. We've got another one, I think, um, ready to pop up on the screen. Will pro writing work with Word? Lydia asked that question. Chris? Yep. So we have uh, for Word on, um, on Microsoft Windows, uh, we actually have a, a full plugin. Uh, so you install it and it appears on the, the Word uh, toolbar. Um, and then you can run all the reports in your Word document. And it'll highlight things. Um, for Word for Mac, it's a little bit trickier because it doesn't support these kind of advanced add-ins. Um, but we have a desktop application, and that will open your Word documents. Um, and then you can make all your edits in there, and you can save it back as a Word document, and it will maintain all of your, your styling. That's great. All right. Um, let's see what comes next here. Is pro writing aid compatible with Scrivener? Cheryl asks. Do documents have to be imported and exported between the programs? No. Well, so uh, this is one of the kind of key things that we've we've been asked for a lot. And um, although Scrivener itself doesn't uh, support add-ins, um, again with our desktop app, what we do is we open up the Scrivener project, um, and then you will see the whole structure of your document, um, just as you would in Scrivener. Um, and then you just click on them and you'll open the, the actual document um, and then you can edit straight into in our desktop app and it will save back to your Scrivener files. So it, it doesn't open in Scrivener, but you don't have to do any exporting or importing or copying and pasting between the programs. They should just work together. Super. All right. Um, we're getting a lot of questions that are, are um, similar. And uh, so we're going to ask a few of those and and um, and try not to duplicate. Elizabeth asks, is it available only in English because I write in my native language, German? Well, yeah, that's a good question. So at the moment, it, it's just for English, but we are trialing a Spanish version. Um, obviously, it's quite a lot of work to, to add new languages to this because you have to kind of um, develop a whole dictionary of all of the aspects of of each language and you have to develop all of the kind of copy editing rules. Um, so we're, we're trialing it with Spanish and, and then we're going to take a view and see where we go from there. Um, but I imagine that, that German would be high on the list of, of future languages. Great. All right. Um, let's see who's up next here. Rich says, I took an advance peek at pro writing it and loved what I saw using Jerry's ferocious editing, I've already pared 75,000 words down to about 60,000. Now I'm worried my entire novel will spiral down the drain. What does Jerry do when his word count goes below what publishers want? Um, what I always like to say, Rich, is that if you've cut, you've improved your manuscript because you're omitting needless words. You're ferociously self-editing. And so what that does is it gives you room for more scenes that are written as lean and tight as the ones you've edited. So, um, you know, it, and, and this is a fairly common problem. The first time people learn this, they realize they've been overwriting 
and it really does add power when you cut it to the bone. And so they, they do worry, you know, I, I've seen people cut their novels in half and they think now I don't have a novel anymore. I've got a novella. Well, that's the time to, to think about what you really would like to add to your story, maybe subplot, you know, maybe extra stuff that, that really makes it work because um, that's going to give you a better uh, end product too. Um, so it's actually good news that w when you see how much you're cutting, because it's going to teach you to write more in a more lean manner in the future as well. All right, let's take another one. Lots of questions pouring in here. Appreciate everybody um, doing this. Uh, this is the one that is fairly common. Lyle asks a question that several have been asking. If I use this program, does it take the place of sending my work to a copy or line editor? My, uh, I'll let Chris speak to this too, but my, my counsel here is I'd rather not see you send your work to a copy or line editor anyway. You need to learn to do this yourself. Why pay for an editor when your publisher is going to edit the, the book anyway? but you want it to be to the point where you're as happy with it as you can be. You're happy with every word. And if you learn to, to ferociously self edit, you should be able to compete in the marketplace without having somebody else copy or line edit before it goes to the publisher. Um, if you do that, if you engage a copy editor or a line editor, and then you send your manuscript in, what is the publisher evaluating your work or the work of, a, of an editor? Um, and regardless, the level it is when you send it in, you want it to be as good as you can possibly make it, they are still going to do their own editing and proofreading and all that. So that's my take on it, is that I want to see you learn to do this yourself. And, the, and Pro Writing Aid can help you do that because it identifies so many of these issues that need to be dealt with. What, what would you say, Chris? Yeah, I, I think, well, my, my attitude is that it, it will never replace uh, an editor. But it, as I said, it gets you all of the quick wins. So, I mean, at an extreme, you could say, you know, if, it, if your document was just full of spelling mistakes, then you'd be wasting the time of your editor. And these are, are a bit more like more complex spelling mistakes. So they're, they're things that you can replace quickly and then you can get more value down the line. Um, well, A, you're more likely to get published, it, um, but then any editing that happens after that, um, again, you get more value from that editing. Great. All right, let's take a few more here. We've got a lot uh, a lot more coming in. It's great to have this uh, this uh, input. We don't have a, a name of the person here, but uh, the question is, is your manuscript safe using pro writing aid? Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, safe is a hard word to define, um, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> I think probably what they mean is that, uh, you know, it, are we going to, to steal your manuscript? Uh, that could be one interpretation. Well, I mean, we sort of process over 100,000 manuscripts every day. Um, so it would be very hard for us to actually even read a, a small percentage of that. Um, plus our business is software. So, you know, we're, we're not in the business of taking people's work. We want to help people improve their work. Um, so. Yes, it is safe. I guess another aspect could be, you know, is it safe saving your documents on our servers? Um, and again, the answer is yes. Um, yeah, we store everything uh, securely. Everything's transmitted, um, encrypted to our servers and stored on there. Uh, and we have very high security on the servers. Um, and if you don't actually choose to save your work on our servers, then it, it's never stored. Or um, unlike some other services, we don't actually use it um, for kind of internal testing and things like that. Uh, so yes, either way, either definition of safe, yes. Yeah, I like to to uh, to tell people that usually beginning writers worry too much about somebody stealing their work. Um, I've been in the business nearly 50 years and I've never seen it happen. Occasionally you hear of a high profile case where some best-selling novelist, somebody claims that they stole their idea and, and it usually comes to nothing. Um, and there are ways to protect yourself. If, if you put something out on the internet, um, you're worried that it's, it's accessible to a lot of people, and it may be. But if you're really worried, you can take your, you know, print your manuscript out, send it to yourself in the mail, and then don't open it when it comes. You'll have a package there unopened that has a postmarked date on it. And 
anybody who claims that you stole their material is going to have to come up with a, a, a source, that source, from an earlier date. And of course, they won't be able to do that. All right, let's move on. Lisa asks, does it tell you the grade level of your manuscript without the need for a complete spell check? Uh, yeah, it does. I mean, so it uses uh, obviously quite a simple heuristic, which is to take all the words and then count the, the syllables. Um, so the syllable check the, in English, um, there's a number of rules for calculating the, the syllables of uh, certain words. But of course, with the strange pronunciations in English, uh, different words break that rule. Um, so you'll get a more accurate uh, assessment. Um, if you send in uh, a, a document which has been spell checked, but it won't make a huge difference. Great, thanks for that question, Lisa. We've got about uh, 17 minutes to go to get to the top of the hour, so we can take uh, several more questions here. And um, Anne asks, when editing to cut, 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 I find my character losing their personality by cutting the way the character actually talks. How do I avoid this, but still edit appropriately? I would say, uh, Anne, that, you know, sometimes when we cut initially, we consider that a first pass through. It's like when you cut your lawn, you mow it, and then you go through with the trimmer to trim the hedges and the edges and that type of thing. Uh, now, where the metaphor breaks down is that if you cut too much from your lawn, you can't add it back. You have to wait for it to grow back. With a manuscript, if I find I've cut so much that my sentences all are choppy, that I've taken the heart or the music, I like to call it, I take that out of it, I go back in and add it. Um, you don't want them to lose their personality. Um, on the other hand, when you talk about cutting the way the character actually talks, characters should speak distinctly and be distinguished from each other. But that doesn't mean if you've got a, a verbose character, you don't want to always reflect all that you might want to synopsize at times and say uh, she went on and on until people were tired from listening to her because people don't want to read long dialogue any more than they want to hear it in in real life um, now as you mentioned your, how your character actually talks if that's just the distinguishing characteristics then you want to emphasize those in my current work in progress that uh, will release in november i've got a, a cop who who you know, speaks much more colloquially than, than other characters. I make sure I do that, but I still try to cut dialogue to the bone. The, as, as short and tight and crisp as you can make it, the better. Uh, the key being distinguishing characters one from another. So I appreciate that uh, question. And uh, anything you want to say on that, Chris? No, I think that I completely agree with you. Uh, you know, you have a lot more um, ability with writing than you do with other things. So, for instance, if you're doing like a, a marble sculpture, if you cut way too much, then there's not really very much you can do. But with writing, as you say, you can you can still add back. Yep, that's the fun of uh, of revision. Um, okay, let's go to another one here. Got about 15 minutes to go. Christine says, when we put our work in the in the aid, the pro writing aid, how protected is our work? Will external sources be able to view our writing? We did just speak to that, but but do do other are other people able to see this, Chris, or is it just your your uh, program? No, I mean when you put your work in, then it, it, it's on your computer. Um, it's sent to our servers to to analyze it, um, but it's never stored on there unless you explicitly store it, um, and then the results are sent back to you. Um, so yeah, nobody can externally see it. And as I said, it's all sent securely um, using what's called HTTPS, um, which is an encryption mechanism. Great, I hope that's uh, helpful to you, Christine. I think you can can use the the uh, tool with confidence that uh, your, your work won't be exposed widely enough to have somebody steal it. Um, someone else asks, my scores on flesh reading ease using pro writing aid is at 95, is this too simple? I think you said uh, earlier, Chris, that 60 or 70 is about right, so. Yeah, so I, I yeah, I mean, 95 is uh, is fine. Um, it, it Again, it depends on your audience, right? So the, the thing is, is your writing stopping people getting immersed in your story? Um, are your sentences too complex? Are your words too long? 
uh, and you just have to take a view on who your audience is um, to decide what what score you should have. Um, and obviously, some parts of your your writing might have a, a higher score, and some might have a lower score. But I, yeah, I mean, yes, it's, I wouldn't say that's too simple. Great. I see a lot of questions coming in about uh, how they can get pro writing aid, the cost, and that type of thing. And we'll we'll make sure we cover that at the at the very end. Um, and it's good to know that people are interested. And um, and I'm uh, marking a few more of the questions here that we want to definitely get to. Um, George asks, can the flesh reading ease level be too low? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean. Um... Yeah, the well, if if you're saying the reading ease or the grade level, um, so I would say yes. I mean, that, that's one of the things is that it, when you add um, more dense words or longer words, then the, the reading ease will change. So the the grade level will go up, um, and that's why, for instance, the U.S. military um, uses flesh reading ease to to try and prevent them using too many long words. Um, and there's now a, a big movement amongst uh, lots of governments um, to try and reduce the, the grade level of their, their documentation, um, to try and engage people more in terms of the, the documents that uh, the government are putting out. Um, so, for instance, you know, new laws that they, they're planning on um, enacting, um, they'll try and, and reduce the, the grade level of um, the flesh reading ease so, so that people can actually understand what, what it you know, would have traditionally been a very kind of uh, verbose um, document. Great. All right, still got some time here and um, a lot of great questions still rolling in. Appreciate you asking that one, George. Anne says, does the dialogue need a new paragraph when there is a change to the character speaking or can they be in the same paragraph? Um, yes, every new speaker deserves his own uh, new paragraph. Occasionally, when somebody's rehearsing or recounting a conversation, you might have it in the same paragraph where you know they're speaking and they're saying, "So I said to him this, and he said to me that." And so that might all you know be in the same paragraph, even though each of those you know he th that person is quoting two speakers, himself or herself and the other person. That would be the only time. Generally, anytime you have a new speaker, you want a new paragraph, yes. Thanks for that uh, question, Ann, and thanks for being with us. All right, let's see who's up next here. Sarah says, concerning dialogue tags, in my book for your novel Blueprint, I tried to show who was speaking through action and never used dialogue tags. Is that taking it too far? It might be, Sarah, I, I did this one time for an entire book just to see what kind of response I would get. I uh, wrote an entire international spy thriller. I never had used one reference to he said, she said, he shouted, she hollered, anything like that. Um, I used action beats. I'd simply describe what the person was doing and then quote them. And you know, not one reader said one thing about that, including my editors and proofreaders. It simply wasn't noticed. Now, I've found since then it was a lot of work. I had to really think that through because the easiest thing is to just say, you know, a line of dialogue he said or she said. Um, but now I use them sparingly and I, I don't use them unless I really need them. So they're there for, as we say, signposts. But uh, yeah, you, doing a whole book without using any dialogue tags might be taking it too far. But if you can do it, it's a good exercise. And I think it made for a, a much more readable book. So uh, something to experiment with there, Sarah. And uh, thanks for that question. Anything on that, Chris, that you want to say? Yeah, I think it's a great thing to aspire to because it really focuses on making making sure that your character's voice is is distinct, um, so the reader doesn't have to question who is is actually speaking. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that uh, question, Sarah. All right, Julie says, do you edit each scene slash chapter as you complete it, or do you wait until the entire manuscript is complete? Uh, I can only tell you, Julie, how I do it. And um, I recommend this uh, strongly to especially beginning writers. Um, a, a lot of people talk about writing an entire novel or an entire book 
um, and then going back and, and editing it. The problem with that is that if you've made a fundamental error, 10 or 15 or 20% of the way into your manuscript, you get there and find that, you change that, it might change the entire rest of your book and you might have to do it all over. What I do is, I the first thing I do every day is I do a heavy edit and rewrite until I'm happy with every word of everything I wrote the day before. Now, I'm a fairly fast writer. I don't use these uh, numbers of pages or numbers of words to, to use as a, as a, a model. Um, but regardless, if you write three pages a day, two pages a day, that's fine. I happen to write 10 or more, but so it takes me a good bit of time to do the editing on that. Sometimes it takes almost the same amount of time to edit and revise as I spent writing it, but I do it every day. So if you can imagine this, imagine my manuscript in a, on a long trail, I'm writing, the next day I'm going back to where I had started the day before, edit and revise that. And that catapults me into my writing for that day. I'm up with the story. I feel good about what I've done. I've polished it to where I'm happy with it. And then I take off that perfectionist cap and I don't listen to my inner critic, my inner editor. Uh, I just want to get the story down. So now I'm writing free form. I might use cliches and redundancies and, and all kinds of mistakes. I don't care about that. I, ha I have to remind myself because I am a per perfectionist. If I see a mistake, I want to fix it. And I just say, no, you can do that tomorrow. You can carve this hunk of meat tomorrow, but now let's just get it on the table. Uh, so then what happens is once I've done that, by the time I'm finished with my entire manuscript, I've written 10 pages or so at a time, gone back and edited those, and then written another 10, gone back and edited those. So really when I'm done with my manuscript, it's had two full pass-throughs. I've written it and I've edited and revised it. So there's two, two drafts. And now I go back and I make a list of things that I should remember. Am I reaching for the emotions, for the heart? Am I remembering to engage the senses? Uh, does everything make sense logically and in, and in free form? So. Uh, and so I'm going through the manuscript one more time from beginning to end and, and fixing anything that needs to be fixed. That works for me. You have to do what works for you. I've heard from people who say, I just can't do that. I have to, to wait until the whole thing's done. Uh, other people, occasionally I hear from people that are there too. One is a nonfiction writer. Philip Yancey is, is, is him. You've probably heard of him. And, um, and then Les Edgerton, who's a, a real gritty uh, fiction writer. These guys edit as they write. They'll write a line. It might not even be an entire sentence, but a line, and they see that line, and they, they have to fix it before they can go on. That would drive me crazy, that mixing the perfectionist with the, the free-form writing. But do what works best for you. The way I do it works for me, and a lot of my students swear by it as well. They just feel like it gives them a sense of momentum, makes them feel like their stuff is, is getting done, and, um, and as I say, propels them into that day's writing. So um, whatever works for you, make it work, Julie. Anything on that, Chris? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think it's it's whatever is not going to stop your momentum. So I think some people, you know, just need to write and write and write, um, whereas other people can write and then do some revision and then write more and then do more revision. So I think the, quest, the answer is uh, if it's not ruining your momentum, then, yeah, sure, go and edit. Um, but if you feel like it, it's stopping you from moving forwards with your writing, uh, then leave the editing till later. Great. All right. Let's take, uh, maybe we can work in a couple more questions here. Uh, Donna asks, can you elaborate on glue words, Chris? Sure. I mean, glue words, so they're the top 200 words in English, excluding personal pronouns, which are the words like he, she, it. Um, so the the kind of structure words. Um, so it, it's quite a, a strange thing. Um, but if you have too many structure words, then it well, we say it, it kind of stops the reader getting through the sentence. Um, so that's why we call them glue words. Um, so, I mean, pretty much any sentence can uh, benefit from a reduction in the number of glue words. Um, but ones where there's a particularly high percentage, um, we highlight so that you can have a look at them and say actually can I write this in, in a better way um, and the answer virtually always is yes yeah so I like the meta heuristic like to, to know what sentences can be improved right I, I like the metaphor of the the glue and the sticky because it does it just slows readers down they hit that word and, and uh, um, they're, they're so common and, and overused that 
you know, you need to, to work on those. Good question, Donna. Thanks for asking that. Yeah, thanks, Donna. Let's see if we can squeeze in another one or two here. Linda says, does all this apply to nonfiction? I'm writing, uh, I'm writing career advice. Does it work as well for nonfiction as fiction, Chris? Uh, things like the sticky sentences definitely uh, works well. Um, I think within Pro Writing Aid, there, there's a you know over 20 reports, and some of them will um, be pertinent to fiction writers only, and some will work for all different types of writers. Uh, so, for instance, the style report, most of the suggestions in there will be applicable to any kind of writing, whether you're writing, uh, you know, technical manuals or nonfiction or career advice. Um, you'll definitely find things in there that help you. And we have a very wide variety of users. I mean, we started off mainly uh, with authors as our, our users, and now we have um, lots of businesses as well, students, uh, a very broad range of people are finding the tool useful for improving their writing. Great. All right, let's take one more question. And then, uh, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of people are asking how they can get this and, and that type of thing. And I know you have a special offer um, so we'll let you speak to that. Uh, Ezra has our last question for today. Thanks to all the, all the rest of you who asked questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, we've had, as I mentioned, several hundred people from all over the world. Ezra asks, is there such a thing as too much editing? What would you say to that, Chris? Um, I think there's such a thing as too much of anything. Um, <laughs> at, at some point, you just need to, to let your manus manuscript go. Um, I think it's easy sometimes to find yourself just going back and forth, kind of yo-yoing between too tight and then adding a bit more back in. Um, I think, well, I'm not, I'm not sure how, how you think about it, Jerry, um, but I think, you know, if you've done two pauses and you're, you're probably just changing things back to the way they were um, after that. Yeah, I always say what makes us authors is knowing when you've stopped making something better and have simply made it different. Uh, it can be very frustrating, especially when you're new, because with the technology today, it's so easy to change things. Every time you look at it, you can change something. Are you making it better or are you only making it different? Once you get a handle on that, you're an author and you say, all right, this is, you know, I could keep changing this, but it's not going to make it better. This is the best I can do. And, and I'm happy with it. So that's uh, where we want to go with that. And yeah, we're out of time. A great way of looking at it, Jerry. Great. Thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, we're out of time. And so I want to thank you for uh, so much for taking part in today's session. I've learned a lot and I'm sure others have as well. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And um, if people have other questions, they can email you. Uh, let me give that um, address. It's hello at prowritingaid.com. Hello at prowritingaid.com. Sure. And um, in a moment, we'll be sending out a special offer to everyone by email. So keep an eye on your inbox. I think you'll be pleased with Chris's generosity. Uh, anything else you want to say about that, Chris? Uh, no, that's uh, fine. They'll find it. And uh, yep. okay, so that, that wraps up this workshop on aggressive self-editing. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we'll see you again soon.